Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Adobe Cold Fusion Developer Week. Uh, for everyone that has joined since this morning, we are bringing on Gavin to talk about building apps with Vue.js and Cold Fusion APIs. Gavin, go ahead and start up your camera and come up on stage here with me. He is loading up. Hope everyone is having a good time. We've had some amazing talks already this morning. There is Gavin. Hi, Gavin. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the invite. Very, very nice. That that don't jump. That fan is scaring me. Like I, I fear for your life. <laughs> uh, I thought I'd better do standing mode so I don't get too fiddly in my chair. <laughs> so, there you go. Yeah, it's a little close though. Just don't stretch. There you go. Well. I think everyone is familiar with Gavin. Um, I am going to go ahead and get you started in your talk mode. So take it away, my friend. OK, let me share my screen. Make sure I get the right one. There's so many. Oh, this is good. Let's see which one's which. OK, which one do you see? I see building apps with Vue.js, the GitHub. Okay, perfect. Let me just see if I can drag this over so I can see some chat, etc. Perfect. Okay. Okie dokie. Well, thanks everybody for joining me. Uh, again, uh, I'm Gavin Pickin. I work with Auto Solutions, and today we're going to be talking about building apps with Vue.js and ColdFusion APIs. So, who am I? For those that don't know, I'm a software consultant for Autis. I work with Coldbox, Commandbox, Box, Box, Box every single day. Been working with Cold Fusion for 22, 23, I'm not sure. It's too many years to remember. Uh, and I've been working for, with JavaScript for just as long. I love learning and I love sharing those lessons learned. Um, so that's why I'm here today. I am from New Zealand. I live in Bakersfield, California, but uh, the accent does sneak out every once in a while. So if you can't understand me, please let me know. Uh, and I'll try and uh, translate. I have to do that for my wife daily. So. I do have a loving wife, lots of kids, countless cryptos, but that's enough about me. Uh, you'll see me on Twitter, gpicking, and autosolutions.com. Okay, you may also see me on the podcast. I'm on the Modernizer Die podcast. We do a CFML news edition every week, and we talk about all the great things going on in the CFML community. So join us for that. And CFCAS, uh, I do a lot of video up on CFCAS, which is our video training service, so uh, check me out there. We've got lots of different things going on there as well. I've started this new thing for our Autos Patreons just recently, coding with Kiwi and Friends. And we've actually been working on this app. So today we're going to be showing you some of the, the API stuff. And we've been working on it there. So we have community members come and help me to build a better app. And we'll also be uh, at Into the Box. So Into the Box this year is our uh, conference in Houston. And it's a two-track conference. We have a pre-conference developer week, lots of great content. We've got five workshops, including mine, which is going to be a deep dive into the Vue.js Spire mobile app with REST APIs. And you guys can meet me there. And CF Summit, hopefully I'll be speaking there too. Uh, depends if Mark and them invite me back. So hopefully they do a good job here. Um, and then after that conference, we're actually doing a, a two-day workshop. So even a bigger, deeper dive into REST APIs and Vue.js. So you get the picture. I do a lot with this. and so. Uh, if this session is interesting, maybe you'll find one of these workshops helpful, too. I don't know if you guys can hear that or not, but uh, what is this app? So we're going to be working on an app called Dev Feud or Developer Feud. And basically, it's a family feud style game with developer-based questions. So it's a uh, Cold Fusion powered code box REST API. And we're going to put Vue.js front end using the Quasar framework so we can deploy to multiple platforms in front of it. So I've always wanted to build a uh, build one like game like this and basically play a game like this maybe at Happy Box. And so I finally built it, and we're going to be doing this and playing this at Into the Box conference. So hopefully, uh, some of you will be there and we get to play this game. So can we do all of this in an hour? Short answer: We can't, but. Uh, we can do a lot in that hour. So I can give you a great overview of everything, show you some demos, show you some code, point you at some other presentations, and 
and build up to this, as well as um, the code itself. So we'll give you that code afterwards. There'll be repos of all the code in it. And um, you know, invite you to those deep dive workshops. You can actually find out a little bit more about it and how to get into that. So I think it's a, a, a great, you know, great starting point. And we'll go from there. So the technology. So we're going to be looking at Cold Fusion for the API. And we're going to be looking at Vue.js for the application side of it for the front end. So I shouldn't have to explain too much about why Cold Fusion. Um, but we love Cold Fusion. We're experienced in Cold Fusion. We're productive in Cold Fusion. We know the pros and cons of Cold Fusion. We know those little tweaks and twerks we have to do. We know how to handle security in Cold Fusion. We know how to support Cold Fusion. We know how to deploy Cold Fusion. So it's the right tool for our team at this time. And a lot of people say the right tool for the job. But if you don't take into consideration your team, your experience, your infrastructure, uh, and all your other experiences there, it's not going to be that, that great for you. So really uh, a big thing with your language selection is you have to do what's best for your team. And Cold Fusion is great. We do a lot of great things there. OK, so why Vue.js? Um, it's the closest of all the JavaScript libraries, I believe, to Cold Fusion. The tag syntax aligns with old school Cold Fusion. And for me, um, that just made it was a really smooth transition, really simple. Uh, the tag syntax aligns with old school Cold Fusion. Like I said, it's reactive. It's got really nice tooling. And I don't have to write HTML inside of JavaScript inside of HTML inside of JavaScript, <laughs> which for me, uh, just, yeah, anyway, enough about that. But for me, uh, like I said, it was fun, easy to learn, and I really like Vue.js. And uh, actually, Alpine is like Vue.js Lite, which is really great to sprinkle around as well. And so that's been good. Hey, Gavin, sorry to yeah. interrupt. Um, I think some people are, are wondering if, uh, if you're supposed to be sharing slides right now or the uh, or your GitHub repo. Uh, that's, yeah, I have slides. So let me stop sharing that. Sorry, I swear. No worries. Uh, no worries. I know. We need more. We, we need more uh, share pods so we can share your whole desktop. I've got uh, I've got four monitors myself, so I know yeah, the pain. And the thing is, the Connect didn't show me the right one. So let me go back. Sorry, let me try. So let's see which screen. Third monitor. Now what do you see? I see a Windows background. That's it. OK, that's the wrong one, too. Wish I had screen numbers pop up. Sorry, everybody. Oh. So what's that one? That one's the repo that again? That one says, what is this app family food oh. style game? OK, right. finally. Sorry, everybody. The, yeah, it's giving me some headaches here. OK, let's try that again. So. Let's jump forward. Sorry, everybody. And you guys see all my little chat messages popping up in the window or no? Hopefully not. So anyway, OK. So this is where we're at, basically. So that's good. We didn't miss too much, nothing too exciting, except for you would have missed a little screenshot. But we'll see more of that in a minute. So anyway, sorry about that, everybody. So why Vue.js? We just talked about that. Let's jump in. So the frameworks. Uh, obviously. Frameworks are one of those things that um, are, are great. They s help solve those you know those problems over and over again that everyone else's face, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. So with Cold Fusion for the API, we're going to use the Cold Box REST API, um, and that's you know basically a whole lot of conventions. That hopefully, you guys saw uh, Luis's session. The last session was a, a great session talking about modern fluent uh, you know APIs, and he went into some of the benefits of using. Box and sort of developing from an old school uh, legacy sort of traditional style API where maybe you use CFCs and um, you know sort of work your way through uh, using routers and, and everything else. So I don't want to cover too much of that because you can obviously watch his recording later. And the Vue.js applications, we're actually going to build three applications. We're going to build a Quasar app for admin so we can basically manage the questions for a little game show quiz. We're also going to uh, have a voting app so you can vote because uh, Family Feud is basically a bunch of questions where people get to vote on what they think the right answer is. And then when you play the game, you're trying to pick the answer that most people have selected. Then we're actually going to have a game app as well. So we can actually play the game and check that out. So there's three different apps. And we're going to use the Quasar framework for all of those. 
So why Coldbox REST APIs? Well, it's a mature and battle-tested framework which solves common problems, so I can focus on my application logic and not having to reinvent how uh, REST works. Don't have to worry about routing. Don't have to worry about rewrites. Don't have to worry about all those different things. Uh, it has great templates for getting started. Um, it has standardized response formats too. So a lot of times people end up building their own response, you know, and everyone's slightly different, but they still end up with the same thing. So a standardized response that you can customize is a great way to get started. And then things like JWT, user permissions, uh, and all that can be built in, you know, and available with the CB security. Uh, and of course, it's modular, so I can use my own or third-party libraries to make it bigger and better. And it encourages and implements best practices, and it's flexible, powerful tooling. So again, you can customize things. And again, Luis's session was great for showing a lot of these things. So why Quasar? Well, one of the big things I like about it is one code base for all. So it outputs to a great number of platforms. So uh, you know, I had an app for a client, and I seriously changed the format that I was producing it for four different times. I think they wanted to start uh, creating a Windows app, then we went to iOS, then we went to Android. Actually, we went back to Windows and then back to uh, Android. And so if I had to do that natively, I would have had to scrap my app, I don't know how many times, but something like Quasar allowed me to write the code once and then output it to whichever format. And actually, we use that multiple formats now because they still want the Windows app sometimes for their trainers, and so we still do that. Uh, Quasar has got amazing components with res responsiveness built in. So that's one of the other things I like about it. It's got a great you know, CSS framework. It's got built up utilities and components, and they're really nice, responsive, uh, and they just, they just work great. So it's a great starting point, and you can obviously customize, but it's a good starting point for sure. It incorporates best web dev practices out of the box, so uh, it just encourages you to use the right things uh, and makes your life easier. And it's a great Vue.js framework with solid core and community. So uh, they've got their own little conference. They've got lots of training videos out there. Uh, it's really, really grown, and it's really pretty simple to start with, too. So I like it. It's a great CLI. And the scaffolding is gives you everything you want and need. And that's what we're going to be using today to start off. So before we build our, uh, our apps, obviously, we got to think about our API. So we should do a little planning first. So this gives us a greater chance of creating a well-designed, well-documented, and consistent API, which will lead to better experience for those developing the API as well as those who are consuming it. Obviously, usually, you're consuming for yourselves, but um, sometimes you want to make that more available. So I actually just did a session on this on the online CF Meetup, because I knew I wouldn't be able to fit all of this into today's session. So this uh, session is up on YouTube. Thanks, Charlie, for hosting me on that. And basically, we went through the whole process of planning it, uh, you know, designing designing all the different pieces to make this work. And so uh, if you guys want to find out more about that, you can jump to there. But I'm going to cover a couple of key highlights here, and then we'll also jump into the code. Again, lots to cover, but I don't want to go over time, which I always do. So keys to a good API, um, documentation is vital. We want to make it easy to onboard for anyone who's using our app. We want to make sure stability and versioning is important, so that way, if you do change things in your app, you can uh, you know just bump the version, so that way people can run off the old version or the new version. We want to make sure it's easy to use, uh, and then encapsulation is important, um, just because you want to make it so it's simple for everyone. And you don't want to make it too complicated. Get it easy to use by you know hiding away the difficulties. So user stories are kind of important, and again, more in that planning session. But you know, basically, we want to use something like this, where as a person, I want to need so that goal scenario, given precondition when actions and inputs, then results. So when we're using this to plan our, uh, our app out, we can do something like this. So as an admin, I want to get a list of questions so that I can display a list of questions to manage. Um, given I'm authorized with an API key with admin permissions. When I select a search criteria page in max rows, then the API gives me a paginated list of questions for those criteria. So these are the types of things that will, will work out. And in the end, uh, that will give us some sort of information. So we'll learn from that. The personas, like who is actually working with our app. The resources, what are they going to be acting on? Which actions will they be taking on that? What inputs should we expect? And what outputs are they going to be given? 
So these personas act on these resources with actions, providing inputs and receiving outputs. So after we've decided all of this and planned it, then we can identify our resources. So in this app, we have questions. Those questions have answers, and those answers have votes. So we have a lot of information in here, and basically we've got a ton of questions, we've got all these answers, and then people have voted on those answers. Next, we have to think about building our URLs. And so we're going to be using the Callbox REST HMVC. So we actually have a, a hierarchy. So we have the API, V1. And then when we're working with questions, we're going to be using uh, the verbs. So we've got gets, posts, puts. And we're going to be passing it to questions, questions with an ID, question ID, questions with a question ID, and answers to get a list of answers for a question. So pretty standard um, resourceful routes set up inside of our app. So that's how we're planning to build our URLs. So if we're using our router, like the Callbox router, there's tools that we have, like the route visualizer, will actually let us jump in and see what the routes are. So you can actually see uh, all the different routes that your app is generating and what type of actions they can have and everything too. So these are really cool little tools just to make it easier when you're working with uh, routes. We also want to look at using existing tools and formats of our API. So the open API, which is also known as Swagger, uh, has YAML, ICK, uh, or JSON formats. Yay! Um, but this outputted um, format basically describes your API. It's documented your API. And tools like uh, editor.swagger.io, if you paste in your Swagger documentation, it'll generate some really cool little output there. And so we've got some tools inside of a, the Coldbox ecosystem to help with that. And then testing. Obviously, we should be testing. And if you guys have created your user uh, stories, you'll actually look here and look, scenario. If we hit a post to API v1 questions, given we authorize with user permissions, when I provide valid fields for a new question, then the API gives me an authorization error because only admins can add new questions. That matches up with that user story we talked about before. So if you create your user stories, it helps you write the tests, and so it gives you the structure of what you should be testing too. OK. What about databases? Well, if we do our user stories properly, we're going to get the, we're going to specify inputs and outputs, and then we can spec out our data models. And so using the database migrations, uh, we can iter iteratively, <laughs> blah, iteratively create, destroy, and recreate our tables until they match what we want and need. So uh, in this app, we have uh, some CF migrations. So we use them, uh, a module with command box to be able to you know, create migrations, run those migrations against our database. And that makes our life easier. And so those are included in the code too. And so here's a simple little design. You know, this, this app isn't too complicated as far as database structure. But for questions, we have a question ID, a question, create a date and a modified date. Nothing too fancy. And so from that, we can, you know, we can basically take that and then figure out how to create a database design. So with CF migrations, um, you generate a CFC when you're building your migrations. And then inside of that, you have an up function and a down function. So in your up function, it basically creates the table. And in the down function, you'll drop the table. So as you migrate up, it creates all the tables that you need. When you migrate down, it's going to go and drop all the tables. And this is great when you work in development, because hopefully you don't have any data in them that you're too worried about. So you just create them all. If you don't like it, delete everything, and then recreate them. And so in here, we're using MySQL. So we've got you know the back ticks and everything. And so we're creating our table. And we've got all the different uh, specific SQL we need to be able to create that, which is great. Now, CF Migrations uses Query Builder, too. So if you haven't seen it, uh, Query Builder, um, it's just a nice way to write fluent queries. And the schema builder, which is part of QB, allows you to do something like this, which will work on different databases. So instead of having all those back ticks that would blow up in most other database tools, you might be able to do something like this. We have a, your up function, you use schema.create. The table is called questions. So you have a closure with a question with a table in there. And then you set up the primary key. So table to increments, question ID, table dot string of question, table dot timestamp created date table.timestamp modified date. And so now we're basically setting up our, you know, setting up our database migrations 
and then we can run them to create our database tables. And now when you pass this app to someone else who needs to run it, they can run their migrations. And if they've configured their app to actually talk to the right database, it'll figure out the format for you. And then you can just update that as needed. So what is in my API? Obviously, we're jumping through this pretty quickly. But um, in the API, we're using Codebox. We've got TestBox in there. We've got some modules like Relax, which is part of the whole Swagger suite. We've got .env to do environment variables, we're using cfconfig to, to load up our variables into our server that we're going to start up. We have CF format for formatting so we can keep our files consistent. Uh, we have CB Swagger, which helps us take the API routes and everything and generate the Swagger docs. CB Swagger UI gives us a nice user interface to actually see what our, uh, our API looks like. CB Validation, which helps us with a lot of validation that we want to do. CB Security, which uh, helps us deal with security, user permissions, and locking down uh, routes and permissions and actions. We have the route visualizer, so we can see what the routes look like. And then we talked about CF migrations, too. So there's a lot of things in there. Most of them are set up, configured right off the bat, so you don't have to do much with them, but they give you a lot of power. And that's what's the benefit of a good framework, is that all these things that you could do yourself, um, but why reinvent the wheel? There's a bunch of standards out there, a bunch of documentation, and a bunch of things that have already been solved, and hopefully best practices, battle-tested. So that's a great place to go. So we want to start our API. Great thing is, Command Box does most of the work. So in Command Box, which most people know that if you have Command Box, you can start a server. But the other things it does is it has a bunch of commands. And so inside of Command Box, you can run a command called Codebox Create. And if you do create app wizard, it'll give you a little wizard that'll walk through creating an app. And you can say, it'll ask you, is this an API? And if you say yes, then it'll ask you, do you want a, a simple API or a hierarchical or I think a versioned API? So if you pick the version API, it gives you the REST template, and that's the one we're used today, the HMVC REST template, which gives you the API versions. The cool thing is it comes with like even mock users and JWT stuff. So you can already log into your API, um, and that's all done. It's just a mock user. So when you want to switch it out, connect it to your database, you basically just connect the, the user and the user service to your database instead of using the mock data. It's pretty cool. Uh, it already comes with Swagger documentation for the pieces that are in there, and all the pieces that are in there already have tests. So it's a good insight to like some best practices and the ways to get things started. And when you're signing an app with Quasar, Quasar CLI does most of the work too. So through NPM, we can do an NPM init Quasar once we've installed the, the Quasar CLI. And then your app wizard asks you a few questions and spits out a great framework application template as well. So it does a lot of work for you. And once we're done generating that, we can basically start up our servers. So uh, you could load this into you know existing Adobe Cold Fusion app uh, server that you have installed in your machine. But today, with the way everything's set up, it's easier to get started using uh, command box. If you do a box start and you just tell it CF engine equals Adobe at 2021, so you tell it the version of Adobe that you want, and then you give it a port. And I recommend using this port so all the links I give you will work and everything will just work together. So once that's set up, uh, command box will load up the environment variables from your .env file. It'll import all your settings from your cfconfig file, start up your version of Cold Fusion you want, and keep that in the server JSON and the port number so each time you start up in the future to work, then you've got to test the app out. So let's go have a look at that. So let me jump out to some code. So right now, this is our little folder here. We've got some, some things in here. Can everybody see my code OK? That was just the folders right now. OK, we can see it. Good enough. We'll make it bigger in a minute. So again, when you start up your, uh, your Cold Fusion app, you start up, basically, you're going to get a bunch of files. And again, a lot of the stuff here is you know best practices. You've got cfconfig. So you've got a bunch of settings that we're going to load into your Adobe server when it starts up. So we've got request timeouts. We've got white space management settings. We've got a couple of things like caches. We also have the data source. You'll see this weird stuff here. These are just environment variables. And so in our .env.example, we have these environment variables here. 
And then the .env is my secret version, so I'm not going to show you that. But basically, it's the same stuff, which is a you know a better password than top secret. But this here tells it how to connect to the database. And so in CF config, it loads up your database name, puts in the host file and the driver and the database name, and all those things that we have in environment variables. And then Adobe knows how to connect to our data source. And we got other things in here too, but I don't want to go into too much detail on, on a lot of the stuff to start with. But we come over here. See, I should have a server already running. So I can open. And here we go. So this is my API that's up and running. So I have welcome to my cold box for SQL service. And if I do some stuff like here, CV Swagger UI, which is a module I installed. Now it's going to do is read my CV Swagger endpoint. And that's going to generate some documentation. And from that, I can come here and look. My questions API endpoint, you know, requires a page, a max rows. You can include answers, yes or no. I can see some examples of, uh, you know, the, the responses. I can see the schema response. I can break it down to see the different things. So there's lots of little pieces built into it. If I want to come up here and look at the route visualizer, I can do that as well. So I can see these different routes. And under API v1, which is a module, I can open that little router here. So we can see some of the routes we have in here. So we have log in and log out and register and who am I and dashboards. And we've got questions. We've got different verbs and everything. So all this is documented. It's pretty neat. And again, it's just some of the little tooling that it gives you off the bat. So we can go into tests as well. If you do test slash runner, we can run our tests. But basically, the, the heart of it is we want to mess around with the API v1. And I'm just going to show you what the questions look like here. Oops. And as you can see, invalid or missing authentication credentials. Because right now, this is a lockdown endpoint. So we've got an error. We've got data. I've got a list of messages coming back, and we've got some pagination. So off the bat, we can already, already basically set up some authentication and everything. So let's jump back into our slides here. And all right, we're going we're gonna to jump around and, and look at some code more as we go. Starting the Quasar app. So once you've initialized your Quasar app, um, you can just do Quasar dev on the command line, and then it's going to start up a little server. So if you don't give it anything particular when you start up, Quasar defaults to a spa mode, which is a single page app mode, and it gives you hot reloading off the bat. Um, you can develop in other formats as well. So if you want to use like an emulator for Android or something, you can actually develop in that. Usually I do most of my stuff in spa mode, and then I just, you know, I can open it up in other modes if I want to as well. And then you can actually add environment variables to your Quasar comp file as well. Um, and then that can be environment specific, so you can have you know different environments there as well. So I think the best way to look at sort of the difference in what I've done since the template, because that's what I want to show you is the scaffolding they give you for both of these apps is pretty cool. You get a lot off the bat, but then I want to show you what I've actually changed because I think that's where the value is. So looking at code diff uh, definitely helps with that, but I also want to look at the demos too. So maybe, maybe we should show you that first. It's kind of exciting to look at this. So what are we talking about? What is all this about? So here we are. We're at the dev feud game. We basically have a little game here. It's all about dev feud. So if I come in here and type in my name, I'm going to start my game. Now, this game uses survey questions from the TerraTech uh, survey, which is the state of the CF Union survey. If you haven't taken the CF survey, um, you can take it right here. The link's here. And you can also view the results here as well. And so every year, TerraTech runs a survey trying to ask you different questions about your you know, life as a developer with Cold Fusion. And we've taken some of the questions and put in here. And so if I start the game, it's going to generate this little user interface for us. And it'll say, which NBC framework do you use? Now remember, I could pick the one I use, or I could pick the one I think is most uh, basically, you know, the most surveyed. So I'm just use cold box and I'll see where it's at on the list. When I pick it, it tells me how many points I scored. It shows the different frameworks. It shows, you know, if something's homegrown or not, et cetera. And 
you can see that you've got you know the answer right there. We've got points have upgraded. We go next. Which version of Adobe Cold Fusion are you running? So we'll say Enterprise. I got 100 points because there's more people using Enterprise than standard from the survey. Right. Which browsers or client platforms do you support in your apps? Hmm. I think Chrome was probably right up there. Yep, Chrome was the number one on that. So I got some more points. Which databases do you use? So most of the time I use MySQL or I use MS SQL. So SQL Server, top score. One more question. So which JavaScript libraries do you use? I have some old ones in here. So today we're talking about Vue, so I've got to pick Vue, even though it might not be the best one. Can anyone tell me what they think the most popular JavaScript framework is? If you guys uh, get the right answer, you can actually win that American Express gift card. So lots of jQueries in the chat there, some React jQueries. What do you guys think? So I give everyone a bit of time. Not sure if we've actually had all the possible answers. So let's see. Let's try. So I think Vue.js. Actually, I don't think it, but that's what I use. So I'm going to vote for it anyway. Wow. So jQuery is the number one. So we'll have to go back, Mark, and figure out who answered jQuery first. There were some pretty quick answers in there. Um, but yeah, so the game over. I scored 400 points. You get 100 points max for the first, uh, the top score for each one. So we've got uh, 400 out of 500. Not too bad. Um, but again, you know, it auto sorts the questions, it highlights the one you've picked, and then if you want to start a new game, you put a name in and, and go again. So this is the, the app here that builds the game. We also have an admin. So if I come over here and log in, I can use my fancy secret, don't look at my password, um, login. I can log in here, I've got a little app. So let me cancel these pop-ups, I'm sorry everybody. So you can see my dashboard shows me I've got 10 questions in the system right now. I've got 76 different possible answers and like 6,800 votes. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I've just got a couple options in here. You know, I can hide and show this menu, but I can also come in here and look at manage questions. So uh, this is one of the Quasar components I love. Uh, it's a, a queue table and it gives you like a data table. So if we start typing CSS, it's going to filter you can see we've only got one record showing here if i clear my filter out it's going to pop them back up if i choose to show just five records per page pagination works and everything and the api is all powering all this in the back end is it's throwing stuff out i can actually come back and add a question so it'd be like uh who is your favorite adobe cold fusion dev week speaker so far so I can create this question. When I create the question, it's going to give me some answers. So we had Charlie up first. And we can say voting count starts at zero. And then we can do Luis. Voting count starts at zero. And then we can add Gavin. And we can say, uh, oops, press the wrong button. And maybe 100 people already like me. So now you see that I've already added my questions in here. I've got some answers. If I go back to my question list here. I can come in there and click on my question. You can see this here. If I want to change here, maybe I want to put full names instead. You now I can do some editing. I'm like, nah, I spelled it wrong. I'll cancel that. I'll re-edit it. I can put it in here now. So I can save it if you want to edit your question. So it's a nice little UI. It's really reactive. Um, you know, it's all hitting the API behind the scenes. And this is online. So it's actually hitting a server online. It's all hosted on DigitalOcean. So the static sites are here. And the API it's hitting is actually based on a Docker image uh, in DigitalOcean as well. So pretty cool. OK, so if we go back to questions here, we can see that we've got lots of questions, including the new one. But now we're like, well, this isn't really cool if you can't vote, right? So let's look at the voting app. So pretty similar look, but it's the voting app here. And if we enter our email address so we can make sure that people don't vote more than they should, Oops, I, can't even type. I can start voting. So I've got two questions to vote for at a time. Obviously, we could do more, but we don't want to overwhelm people. So here we can say, which version of Cold Fusion do you use? Uh, Adobe 2021. And here it shows you the number of votes after you voted to. And then it adds your vote to the list. And if we go next, which browsers and client platforms do you support? 
So the most popular one is probably going to be Chrome, so we'll vote Chrome. So we've voted on all your questions, so it thanks us. And then if we want to vote on more, it's going to generate another one and gets us to vote some more. So who's your favorite ADC? Yeah, I think it's me. So I'm going to vote for that. Which frameworks to use? I use Codebox. And again, vote more questions. So a little tool, doing all the work. Um, and away we go. Okay, so those are the three apps we have built. And obviously, we got the API behind it. We've looked a little bit about the API. So we've got some security built in. If we go to different endpoints, we do different things. So let's look at the code a little bit. OK. So in our modular app, we have modules here. And then we have our core, which is where I shove my services. So I've got a, a, an answer entity, a question entity, and a vote entity. And I built these on Quick, so it's got some cool stuff in here. Uh, and again, we're not going to go through too much because there's a lot to it. But basically, we have a question. Question has answers. Questions have votes for their answer. So we have uh, question has many answers. Questions have many uh, votes through answers. And then we have little functions here for deleting votes too. Uh, Quick does a lot of the work for us, so we don't have to write a lot of SQL or queries, but we can as well if we want to. And we have things like votes. Votes belong to one answer. An answer has many votes, and a question has one, uh, sorry, an uh, answer has one question. So there's our relationships mapped in here too. So if we look up here though, when we look at our API, we can go look into our version one, we can go to handlers, we can see some of the handlers we're working with. If we want to look at our routes, we go into the router file, and you can see some of the routes we built here. So that dashboard we looked at before is a dashboard endpoint here, and it goes to the dashboard's handler and the index action. So in here, what dashboards does is it just generates a, a list of dashboard items, gives us a group, and it basically loops through and gives us a count of questions, gives us a count of answers, gives us a count of the votes. And so this basically generates those little cards for us to make it look good. If we look here at games, what games does is it hits the handler games. And because we're posting to it, it's going to hit the create endpoint. So in here under games, we have a post to create. So in this here, it's going to do some, some tricky stuff. So using quick, we can do things like question service dot with count answers. So it's going to count the number of answers per question when we get it. We're going to order it by random. So that way, we're always giving a random set of questions. We're going to get the query back so we don't create any objects, and we're just going to get five at a time. And so this is just some little shorthand, so we don't have to write any SQL. And then here, what we're going to do is we're actually going to get some answers back as well for the questions, and then we're going to merge them together. So basically, when we get our questions, uh, and you know, it has the questions with all the answers in there, and so that's, that does the trick. And then we're using our response. So our PRC response is a cold box option for giving a response back. So we can set that data with pagination information and send it back to the server. So like our API handler is pretty slick. Now, obviously, I'm showing a lot of stuff really quickly here. And again, I apologize. We only have an hour. So I'm trying to get to the good stuff. Um, but I just want to show you some of the pieces we have in here. Now, for questions. We have things like pagination. So we've got the page and max rows. And then we've got sorting and everything here. So all this information in here, um, you know, here we do a little cleanup for sorting. So we check to see if it's a descending or not. And we do ascending or descending. And we can basically make sure that uh, if it's not sorting by anything, we're going to default to question. And we'll also default to ascending. And Luis's last uh, presentation, you would have seen some things where he was doing validate or fail. And this is my little shortcut for it here. So we can clean up our RC scope and validate our content. And then we can do a little search here. So when we're looking at the question service, we want a list of questions. We can say, you know, when the question is not, not empty, then we're going to do a where like on the question with a count, order by, retrieve query, and then paginate it. So all this stuff just makes our life easier. Because imagine the SQL I have to write here, right? Um, if I was going to write all this as a SQL uh, from scratch without any help, that'd be a lot of work. So these little tools, they all make our life easier.
Okay, so let's look at that admin app real quick here. So behind the scenes, when we go to manage questions, and we pull up this here, behind the scenes, what it's doing, it's hitting that questions endpoint. So why is this not working? What makes this different? Why does it have a security credential issue? So on my questions handler here, I didn't have something here saying, uh, if the JWT is valid, you know, I don't have any of this code here. So what's doing this, uh, the security here? So CB security is set up. That's a module. And so we have some setup in here and I'll call box app and it comes with that automatically. And what it does is it requires a little bit of work. So CB security, it requires a user object. So here's a simple user object that we give you and has a little bit of notification. So we never include the password when we ask for a user. We have some constraints on what makes a good user. And this is just a sort of a cookie cutter template for you. And there's a couple little permissions in here, like has permissions is something that CPU security needs to see if someone has permission to do something or not. And so this is the little sample that comes with the REST app. And under user service, when you actually ask for a user, there's this little mock users here. And so basically we create this little mock user and that way you don't have to even connect to the database to try out this template. This template is going to have a user that you can use and we can fire it up. Okay. So if we come over here and we look at CB Swagger, it's going to pull up the Swagger documentation for our app. And so a lot of it's already generated. Okay, great. What does that mean to me as a developer? What it means is if you use Postman, you could import basically new workspace. You can import that, that Swagger doc. That's going to generate this. So it's going to give you all the tools you need to be able to, uh, you know, log in a user. So here's the login user. You can put in your email and password. You can actually log in and it's going to spit out some JWT information. And then you can actually make that. So when you're going to get a list of questions, here, we can actually include that as part of our authentication. So we can, you know, come in here and, you know, add the right authentication we need. So right now the authentication is here already. So if we try to send this, it's not working. Oops, I got to probably log in again. Or I'll show you how the security works on this. If we go to questions right now and go to the top of the page here, you'll see this is secured. If we take this off, and save it. Now we hit this again. Now we get our questions. So that little metadata right there just locked down this entire handler. If we take that off, now the handler is not secured. If we come in here and just say secured for the index, now we try and hit it again. The handler is not locked down, but that action is. And you can also, if you want to, pass permissions. So you can actually say they need to be in, have the admin permission, and then it will look for that too. So there's a lot of different pieces to CB security. This is just a taste of it. But basically, just installing it here, you can just throw in something like secured, and now you have to have a valid JWT token. So you might think, well, how does it know? What is it doing? Well, all our handlers are extending our base handler in this case, and this base handler is my base handler I made. So in this base handler here, uh, I have an extending of the call box one. So the call box rest handler gives you tons of functionality off the bat. I added, added a couple little things here, like this VOF, which is basically a, a little helper to give my validate or fail. Um, we've got a couple little things like pagination constraints, so I can just use that in other places. But basically, it just it's all the cold box rest handler. And so that has all the power. So if we go look at that real quick, so I'm going to get some view code here real soon. But in the rest handler here, we have you know allowed methods. We have the around handler, which does all the work. So this keeps track of everything. And then the cool thing here is anything you do in your, in your API response, if it throws an error, It'll catch it and handle it a certain way. So no more boilerplate. And Luis showed this too, where if you basically have invalid credentials, it's going to throw this error, and then it's going to catch it this way. And so when it catches it, it looks the same every time. 
uh, if you have uh, a validation exception. But it can, if you throw a validation exception, it'll catch it. You don't have to do the all the response and how to respond to a validation exception. This here will show you how to do it. So it'll actually uh, get the event. It'll set the error to true. It'll set the data if you have any data in there. It'll add a validation method. It'll set the status code the right way. It'll set the status checks. It does all that for you. So all the stuff that you could do yourself, it's going to do for you. Okay. Lots and lots and lots of stuff in here, right? So that's all the cold fusion stuff. And again, we've done a few sessions on cold box API. Luis's session last time did a lot of great things too. But okay, with this, sorry, this question is popping up here. I'm trying to keep up with them, but this flies past here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I hear the console. I'll just pull it down for right now. Sorry, everybody. So, so, yes, there's a lot of cool things in here. We've got the API handlers. We've got a handler for games. We've got a handler for votable questions so we can make sure we only get questions that we haven't actually answered before. Um, so a lot of stuff in here. And I said, I'll let you look through the code. Um, I think the more exciting stuff and the stuff I really want to get into is the view stuff. So in our view app, Quasar gives you some great stuff. So let's look at the game first. It's pretty simple in the most parts. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up the code here and look at the game and see the difference. Because this is basically what changes from one piece to the other. So the package of JSON, when we install a few things, it, it creates a few changes in there on the package lock as well. In the Quasar configuration, uh, I added some environment variables. I changed the ports that could all run at the same time. And I added a notification. So if we look in here, the Quasar comp file. This is where all your all your configuration happens for it. And the cool is that most of it right off the bat comes out and there's documentation links everywhere in there. So if you want to find out more about what it's doing, you can. And so right in here under build, there's a way for you to add environment variables. And so in this here, I basically have a little um, a little context div. So if we're in dev mode, we're going to have the environment set to div and the API is set to this URL. Now, if we're in production mode, then it's going to use this URL, and you can even have a staging URL too. But basically, you can have a set of environment variables. So when you're running it locally, it'll hit different endpoints and have different settings. And then when you run in production or staging, it can do that as well. So I think that's pretty cool that you can do environment variables in your Quasar app. Now, what is all this stuff in here? So yeah, I know, hard-coded environment variables, you can pass them directly when you're doing a build process. Uh, obviously, these are just, uh, there's no passwords or anything in here, but you can actually have it read, and basically it pulls up as like process.env.whatever. So it's just a little wrapper to make it easier for those little comments about environment variables. Okay, so again, Quasar, the CLI, when you build it, it gives you a ton of stuff. So what are these folders? So we got a couple of hidden things here, no, not a big deal. This distribution folder, whenever you build something from this app, it's gonna throw it here. So the Quasar game, we've already built an Electron app, and we have a Spa app. So if I wanna upload my app, I basically just upload the Spa folder to my web server, which is what I did without play the game, and it outputs an index HTML, it's got our family tube background, it's got some style sheets and fonts and JavaScript and whatever, that is the output. If I want to create an Electron app from this, which you can, it'll spit out my Electron app. So I've got unpackaged stuff, and I've got the, the game itself. And so if I want to play this game locally, let me pull up my folder here. Sorry, everybody. I should have had this one open as well. So if I come over here, go into my distribution folder of the game, and I go to my Electron app, I go to the this version here. I can actually double click on the executable right here. It's going to spin it up in the Electron app. It's going to load my game. So this is the same code that I deployed as a spy a minute ago. So if I come in here and go to Gavin and stop my game, here's my game. You can see I've got the Electron options up here. So you've got some of the, the basics and all these things in here you can configure. But your Electron app, if I want to make this Electron app, all I have to do, bring up my terminal a little bit more, as I go to this folder here, and I go Quasar build minus n 
and then I tell it what I want to build. I want to build Electron, or I want to build Android, but we want to build Electron. So when we do that, what it does is it actually generates a new folder for us if we haven't already got it. And in this folder, this is where you just, these are the differences. And so the cool thing about Quasar is your source folder right here, this is your app. So this is where we're going to work most of the time. But this little source, if you each different type you build, it can give you options. So in here, you can tweak stuff to make your app a little different for Electron versus something else. Okay, so I'm going to shrink this down again and go back. So that's our distribution folder. Okay, that's our outputs. Our node modules, don't ever click on that. It's huge. It's unsightly. But it's okay because when you build it, uh, you just output the pieces you need and all the rest of it dies and hides. Um, the cool thing is, you get ignore that it creates, it ignores things like the node modules folder, and it ignores all these generated folders and everything else, and that comes out of the bat. You don't have to, like, install it and then figure out what you want to include and exclude in your repo. It does it for you, which is a huge win. I love it. And so then you've got some folders. So you've got a public folder in here, so you can do some public, uh, you know, assets or whatnot, and so that is used by your source folder. Now, these are a lot of build configuration things you've got, you know, if you want to change your linting setup, you can do that. And by default, when you start it up, it asks you what type of linting you like. You can choose Airbnb or GitHub or, you know, it gives you all those options. It sets up Babel for you. It sets up all the pieces you need to build this. Um, so, again, I don't even touch any of this stuff. I work in the source folder. So this is my app. This is where I live. So my index template, it sets it up. It has variables for the product name and everything. It don't, you don't have to touch any of this stuff. Your icons, you can change if you want to change your icon, but it does all the work there. The app view starts up your app. That's all you need. And then it's Quasar. So Quasar's framework is set up in a certain way. So out of the, you know, out of the box, I guess we could say that, you get assets. You can basically put any assets you want to use, like the Autos logo that we're using. Any outside external libraries we want to use, we're using Axios, so it gives us a file so we can boot Axios, so we can use it through our app. You can have a phone component for, sorry, a folder for components, so you can put some reusable components in there. If you want to tweak your styles, so you can actually come in here and change your variables, very much like Bootstrap and everything, so you can change your colors if you want, and then all the components use those color schemes, so it's really handy for customizing it. Your layouts, you can have a layout. Uh, we got a couple of different layouts here. We got a game layout, a main layout, and then you have your pages. And so we've got a 404, we've got an index, we've got a game. So really simple, just you know, a couple of pages in here, and then we have our router. And again, this just basically sets it up so we can use it. We even have some permissions uh, in, in the admin app to like check when you're changing routes to make sure you have permission to access it. But in here, the routes we have forward slash, it takes you to the index page, and we use the main layout. When you hit slash game, use the game layout, and use the game view. That's it. That's all you need to know to get your routes set up. Pretty straightforward. Copy, paste even, and you can get some children set up. So again, it's, it's a framework, but it's not hard to get up and running. If you don't even have a path, it can give you a 4 or 4 page. And then Inside the store, if you guys have used uh, Vuex before, um, this is basically your Vuex store. And so in here, you've got your index, which allows you to import mo basically modules. So this one here doesn't even use a Vuex store. Um, the admin does a little bit more, so we're using that. So this one here, we're not even using. So basically, on our pages, this is it. So if we go and look at the game, my code, go up here to game. I'm looking at this here. This, everything here. This is basically a page. So we've got a a div, another div. We got a label. We've got a Q input. So this is a Quasar component for input. It's going to map the name field. Well, if you push enter, it's going to start the game. If you click the button down here, start the game. It'll start the game. And all this does here is it pushes you to a new path. And passes that information along. And again, this is I'm hoping that this is a great starting point for you guys to get into view if you haven't done it. Now the game view, there's a lot more code in here. You've got 
if statements here. So very cool fusion if, if you're displaying it. Um, sorry, if you're not displaying it, show loading questions. If we are displaying it, then we're going to show all the stuff in these divs. And so we've got the name of the person, we've got the current score, um, a lot of different things in here. And for those asking questions, we're actually in view, we're in view two for this, but you can use view three as well with Quasar, so it, you can get to choose. Uh, you can even use TypeScript now as well if you guys prefer TypeScript. Uh, it's up to you. So there's a lot of different pieces in here, um, and again. View allows you to componentize stuff as well. I try to keep it in the page for the most part, just so you can see it. But basically, we've built this little app. And again, if we want to run it locally so we could see some of that, we're going to just do Quasar. Oops, I'll do that. I'm going to type over here Quasar div. And what it's going to do is it's going to roll through, it's going to spit out a spa mode for us, and it's going to set up all the hot reloading and everything for us. So we can actually tweak this a little bit and see what happens. So this app is on the online here. So we're going to have a new one pop up in a minute. And that's going to give us the access to do that. And again, I say Quasar. It's just a framework. It's a place where you put files. It's an organization. It's a starting point. And it just gives you the ability with it, those configuration options to be able to generate those different types. And that's what I, I think is pretty cool. So here it is. It's spinning up on 8081. Did I break it? That would be my luck, right? Wow. Yep, always something goes wrong. That's really weird. It was running perfectly before I started this. Okay, well, we also have a voting app and we have an admin. So we'll start one of these up and see what happens over here. So let's start the voting app as well. And again, the voting app is very similar to the game app. There's just a couple of pages in here. So under pages, we have index and voting. It's very similar. Now, if you want to see a little bit more complicated app, this admin app is a lot more. And the admin shows off a lot more cool things. Like inside that um, questions, the questions page itself. Remember, I did all those data tables work, right? So here's a queue table here. Basically, I set up a few things. So I give it some, some questions. I tell it the columns. I give it the filters. I basically set up some stuff here. And I can basically loop through with a question and everything. But it's not too much work. And on the other side of things, like you get all of this functionality. You point it at an API. It knows whenever you start filtering, how you refetch the data, reload the data. You know, like it's it's got a lot of stuff built straight in. Uh, I like all the formatting and everything else. Um, you know, it's hold on here. Oh, someone's making sure I'm not lip syncing. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm breaking everything. That's for sure. I wonder what is going on. So let's see. It might just be. It's just straight up not returning. I wonder if I actually have another app running on the same port and I'm just freaking it out. I might not have killed it properly before. That's why we have lots of lots of stuff here. So let me jump back. I'm going to jump back into the slides here and we'll we'll go through it a bit more. But oh actually the diff. So the diff stuff here again. You know, I, I changed a few things in the Axios. And so in the Axios file here, you can actually see, uh, you know, we can set up the base URL from the environment variables. Uh, if we look at the admin app, though, when we look at the Axios, I actually do some work here where I get the JWT. So I'm actually storing the JWT when you log in inside the app state. So it's actually storing it kind of like in a session. And then I can actually passing that different information too. So in that app, you actually you have two different Axios connections. You've got an Axios instance and a login instance. And that instance automatically has a JWT. So there's lots of different pieces. Uh, 
And so the, I really want to give you guys the code to be able to look through because, again, a lot to cover in one hour. Um, so, okay. So, let's pull up here. So, slideshow. So, the diff is really good. I've committed the code when um, the chat, sorry, not the chat, when the the initialization scaffolding was done, and then I'm actually committing the code basically as it's sort of ready for you guys to, to work on. So when you guys go to the repos, which I'll share the link with here in a minute, you'll be able to see the difference. And look at the diffs, because that's what I've done. A lot of it comes in there already, and then the diff is what's sort of the important part. So again, the key with Quasar and all of this is if you do a Quasar build and you tell it the version Electron or Android or iOS, it can go out and spit out those different versions for you. Now, Android does require you to basically run the Android build underneath. So it uses Cordova, or you can set up to use Capacitor. The iOS build, it'll spit out the files you need. And in the end, it will create, uh, you know, the Xcode projects that you can run Xcode to actually generate it. So it's not actually replacing those tools. It's not replacing that build process. It's trying to make it easier for you to get ready to build those. So. If I close all this stuff off here and shrink this down, if we look at the admin and we look at the disk, we only have a spar app. That's all I've done for that one. If we look at the game and go to the disk, we'll see we have an Electron app. And so it's sped out all the Electron files. If we go to the voting game, uh, sped out a Cordova app too. So it's an Android app. And if you look in the APK, you can see it's generated the APK for us to install. So you could sideload that onto one of your uh, your Android tablet or your phone, and you can play around with the app just like that. And if you look inside the source code over folder, you can see it actually generated uh, the hooks, the plugins. It's got an, its own package to JSON here. It's got its own config XML file in here. So it generates all those different things. And so you can tweak as needed these different things. Um, and then from there, it'll build that out. And so if you want to you know, if you build it and you need to make a couple of changes, you can recompile it from there. So it's basically the source code here, when you build it, outputs it to this folder, and then it'll spit out the executable that you need to distribute or, or whatnot. And again, it depends on your system. If you're running on Windows, you can't export the iOS system, but it can generate the Xcode stuff that you need to be able to run in an iOS system. So, you know, this is a, a great tool. And again, I've used some other tools that did some similar to this, but it really... This stuff here, when you generate it, like I have a Cordova app. I can go in and tweak it, but it does most of the stuff you need to do without you having to do anything else. The Electron app, again, you can go in and tweak it as well. But right off the bat, like, it's usable from the start. I mean, it really is. And then if you want to get into, you know, tweaking it, changing the menus or anything else, it's Electron. So just like you would normally tweak Electron, you can do that. And again, in the configuration file, if we go down here to Electron. You can see. Hey, hey Gavin, here. sorry to sorry to interrupt you. We are at we're actually over time. Okay. Um, and I wanted you to get a chance to at least answer a, a few a few questions. Um, sure. The gap between this talk and the next talk is actually half of the one before. Gotcha. Um, so if you could just grab a couple of those, let's get those answered and um, yeah, get it all for sure. One. Anyway, so hopefully you guys found it interesting and inspiring, and we want to go learn more. And again, I gave you a list of different places I'll be and things you can get more information. And so questions, let me stop sharing so I can see the window properly because I couldn't see them properly in that the other view. Okay, so where are the questions? So CF migrations, is that ORM oriented? No, uh, it's actually straightforward, simple. You can write queries, um, just query execute, or um, you can use, you know, sort of QB, but it doesn't really start up anything. It's actually running from the command line there. So that's the special AE character that I don't recognize. Um, so questions, let me scroll down. I see a lot of jQueries on the questions. Um, so I will be sharing the code uh, on the next page. We'll show that um, in a second. Uh, extensions using VS Code. Um, so on the CFML News Podcast, we show a new extension every week, and there's a whole slew of them that we've covered. So uh, there's a few blog posts on the order site. If you go look at that, that shows all the, the main ones. But the CFML extension by Kamasama K 
is the one we're using, although we do have a, a link to try, go check out the Adobe one for Adobe Confusion Builder. So I'm curious to see how that will work out. I want to play with that. Uh, let's see. So if we tweak the FE, we must build all the Quasar types of generated apps. I'm not sure what the FE is, the front end. Um, yeah, if you change the front end, you'll have to regenerate them and deploy them. Yeah. But you can just run a process that generates them all and then redeploys if you have build structures. Um, and what is the address, 000 address versus localhost? I think the 000 in the configuration file that you saw just basically says it'll bind to anything that hits that machine. Um, so let me share my screen again real quick. I think it was screen one. So let me do that one and we'll have some links here for learning more. So yeah, the repo itself, uh, 2022 ACF DF DW Dev Feud presentation. It links to the other four repos, uh, and I just have to push my code now that I've stopped tweaking it. Um, so it'll have the the new code up there shortly. Um, and these are some of the places you can go find out more. Um, but again, we're going to be at Into the Box doing a workshop. We get way more time to cover this stuff, and then CF Summit after CF Summit, we're doing a workshop where we're diving into the same type of stuff. So um, you know, I think there's a a lot of great stuff. Um, Mark, if you can put that link in the chat or I'll, I think I sent it to you on Slack or I'll put it in there. And then, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Hit me up and I'll try and give you guys some good answers. But Quasar is great. QGS is great. And then obviously we can build the stuff with ColdFusion APIs and there's a great way to do it. And I just talked about Cobox. I mean, there's other frameworks and like Taffy and then obviously there's built-in risk with Adobe ColdFusion as well. But, you know, we build the tools that we, we use and so we just keep tweaking them to make them better. So anyway, hopefully that was uh, you know good for everybody. If there any more questions, let me know. But who answered jQuery first? I think was it Jim? Um, the first that one that I saw was someone named Christy. It seemed oh, like Christy, Christy was very early in the in the chat, right right at the very top. Okay. I don't know who Christy is though. <laughs> um, okay. So if Chris if Chris could. Uh, I mean, I'd have to go look that up. Um, but yeah. if they could message me, that would be fantastic. Yep, that would be great. So, but yeah, hopefully everyone enjoyed it. Like I said, it was fun to play with. Uh, I'm going to be adding some more descriptions to that that repo, so you get the links to actually go look online too, so you guys can play the game and vote for the questions. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully you guys will spin it up locally as well and try it out and you know get familiar with some of the things we're doing in it and go from there. Okay. Fantastic. So you can see the, the, the link to GitHub here on the thank you page is the link that you had posted earlier. So folks that are interested in pulling down those repos, doing some uh, doing some looking through there can click on that. Um, as always, uh, if folks could make sure to please, please, please give us some feedback. The speakers find this information very valuable uh, to help them hone their craft. I want to thank Gavin so very much for sharing all of that incredible information with us. Um, I'm super excited to, to to go back through on the recording later and <laughs> pick it apart. Yeah. I know uh, I jammed so much into the hour, but I'm, I just hope to touch on enough to get people excited to go look themselves because you, know, you can't do all this in an hour. But hopefully, I'm, I'm inspired I'm, to go look. I'm 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 super excited. This I, I love Cordova. I love all that 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 type of stuff. So um, I will definitely be in there looking at things myself as well. Um, coming up next in just about 25, 24, yikes, minutes, Learn DevOps, CI, CD, and Pipelines with Cold Fusion 2021 by Brian Sappy. So uh, hopefully everyone will stick around for that. Uh, thank you again, Gavin. And we're just going to leave this poll up for a little bit and then get back to the lobby. Awesome. Thank you so much.